is on a perfectly beautiful day and I am sitting down with my foot up because yesterday one thing if you were watching my video about staking up tomatoes um, there was a mishap I brought that ding-dong rebar pounder right down on my leg when I was pounding those tea steaks and I just powered through and pretended it didn't happen and thank God my leg wasn't broken until the job was done and you know I'd made dinner and put the kids to bed and um, realized wow I really hurt myself I was in a lot of pain um, and so today I am not um, hustling around and doing all the homesteady things that I would usually be doing it is this beautiful day and I am sitting down during the kids quiet time with my foot up and I feel like the biggest schlub but I know it's what I gotta do. Um, for those of you who don't wanna see grossness, close your eyes, I'll show you what I did. Hang tight one second, let me flip this around. I know, it's pretty gross, sorry to show you. So, as luck would have it, something special came in the mail today and I'm going to sit and look at it. Wanna see what I got? Mm. Every now and again, I find an amazing deal on an old 1800s cookbook and I have been very slowly over years uh, building a collection of really old cookbooks and the thing about that is sometimes at estate sales or yard sales or on eBay you know you'll find an 1800s recipe book for like 400 or 500 dollars and oh my gosh that's a number I can't even dream about but if you keep your eyes open, sometimes you can find those same titles and same editions just being sold like any old book for like $11. And I don't know about you, but I can usually find a way if I see a book that's published in the middle of the 1800s full of beautiful old recipes for like $11, I can usually finagle that into the budget. How beautiful is this? So. I'm not outside hustling doing homesteady things today, but I thought you might like to take a gander through this beauty with me. Let's take a look. It is the Practical American Cookery and Domestic Economy, compiled by Elizabeth M. Hall, illustrated. And look at the year on that, 1856. Isn't that beautiful? You know, one thing about video, I wish I could let you smell this book. It smells as beautiful as it is essence of lovely old book let's look at the sections contents soups beef veal mutton lamb why don't we have mutton anymore I mean pork poultry game etc salt and freshwater fish sauces vegetables salads potted meats Pies, puddings, tarts, tartlets, puffs, etc. Oh, yes, please. Pancakes, fritters, muffins, and waffles. Eggs and omelets, butter, cheese, etc. Custards, creams, ices, jellies, marmalades, etc. Confectionery, preserved fruits, etc. Pickles, it's its whole own category. I love that. Cakes, buns, biscuits, bread, etc. Ooh, there's more. Coffee, tea, chocolate, cocoa, homemade wines. Okay, gotta check that out. Liquors, beverages, etc. Preparations for the sick. Don't you love it how in the 1800s they put recipes specifically for the sick right in with every cookbook? Every cookbook from the 1800s has this a section for healthful, easy to digest recipes for the sick. I think we should still do that. And then some notes on domestic economy. The orchard and garden medicinal recipes. Lovely. I can't wait to read all of this. Sections on carving. Interesting. It tells about how to serve. This is kind of fun. And look at that picture. I love the images. 
carving presents no difficulties. It simply it requires simply knowledge. All displays of exertion or violence are in very bad taste. I will have to remember that the next time I carve a turkey. Interesting. Fowls are very easily carved. So interesting. Let's keep flipping. I wish that I had you here with me so we could chat about what we should check out. What should we take a look at? Ooh, mutton soup. I don't know why I have this obsession with mutton not being available anymore. It was just such a staple back in all of the 1800s cookbooks. And now we have lamb, um, which in itself tends to be not necessarily the easiest thing to come by. Um, but mutton is not something you ever see. How to choose fish. Some good notes on how to choose fish. I have a feeling I'm going to be sharing some recipes out of here. Wow, mutton like venison. This is beautiful. Okay, let's check out sweet stuff like pies and cakes. Let's see what we can find. Potted meats, ooh, potted pigeon. Hmm. Let's take a look. Here's the pie section. I do love pies. The greatest possible cleanliness and nicety should be observed in making pastry. The slab or board paste rollers, tins, cutters, stamps, everything in fact used for it, and especially the hands, should be equally free from the slightest soil or particle of dust. The more expeditiously the finer kinds of crust are made and dispatched to the oven, and the less they are touched, the better. Well, that is certainly true. That's good advice. Much of their excellence depends upon the baking also. They should have a sufficient degree of heat to raise them quickly, but not so fierce a one as to color them too much before they are done, and still less to burn them. The oven door should remain closed after they are put in and not be removed until the paste is set. Large raised pies require a steadily sustained heat, and to ensure this, the oven should be made very hot, then cleared, and closely shut from half to a whole hour before it is used to concentrate the heat. It's so interesting to remember that, of course, electric or gas stoves were not um, what were available in that day. This is all cooking with wood. Here's a lovely recipe for puff paste. Paste for borders of dishes. Fancy pastry. Sandwich pastry. I have not heard of sandwich pastry. Well, that is interesting. Giblet pie. Okay, this is interesting because I have all kinds of giblets in my freezer. We processed the meat chickens a couple of weeks ago, and so I have tons of chicken giblets in my freezer that I've been wondering what I'm going to do with. Let's see. Let's read about giblet pie. For goose giblets, you must boil them a short time. When cold, chop them in small pieces and cut the gizzard, heart, and liver in slices. Stew them for a quarter of an hour in some good stock. When cold, line your dish with veal cutlets or rump steaks. Use hard-boiled eggs to this pie, then season. If to go into an imitation raised pie, thicken the giblets. If in a dish, garnish. So interesting in what a different way they assume a set of knowledge in these cookbooks from the 1800s. They assume that we'll know exactly what a raised pie is versus a dish. And um, for me at least, maybe some of you know exactly what these recipes mean and intend. For me, it takes a little bit of research to find out exactly what was intended. An old fashioned recipe for mint pie. Oh my goodness, look at this. <laughs> okay. This almost makes me tear up a little bit. These are old pressed flowers that have been in this lovely old 1850s book for who knows how many decades. 
Now, there's no saying this is as old as the book is. You know, maybe they were put in there a hundred years later, but they'd still be very old, even if so. Wow, they don't have much color left, but let's take a tiny little look. I don't want to crumble them. Oh, it's hard to move them without breaking them. Someone pressed flowers in this book a very long time ago. That is charming. You just never know what treasures you're going to find when you pick up an old book. Right in the section of apple and minced pies. That's kind of fun. Here's how they made a pumpkin pie. Stew the pumpkin in a covered vessel until soft enough to mash. Then set a colander. Look at the spelling of colander. With a U, colander or sieve into the basin and press it through into the basin. When rubbed through, add to it milk enough to make a thin batter. To every quart of this batter, put four well-beaten eggs, a small teacup of sugar, and a salt spoonful of salt. For each quart, grate in a nutmeg. Of course, it wasn't just ground nutmeg in those days. You would grate a nutmeg with a nutmeg grater. And a teaspoonful of extract of lemon and some ground ginger if liked. Many prefer it without ginger. Well, I like my pumpkin pie with ginger. How about you? Line flat-bottomed pie dishes with pie paste and nearly fill them with a pumpkin mixture. Lay a strip of paste around the edge, trim off the outside neatly, and bake three quarters of an hour in a quick oven. The top of the pie should be delicately brown. Ornament to taste. I wonder how they would ornament a pumpkin pie back in those days. That would be interesting to find out too. Puddings of all kinds. And of course, in those days, what they meant by a pudding was a steamed pudding that you would pour into either a cloth or a pudding mold. Um, not like a pudding that you would, you know, chocolate or vanilla pudding that we're used to these days. And my goodness, there was a whole art to making puddings. Lots of pudding recipes. That's something we'd rather let go by the wayside, I think. Suet pudding. Wow. Roly poly. You know what that makes me think of? Um, have you read the book, um, The Roly Poly Pudding um, by Beatrix Potter? I really like that one. The Tale of Little Tom Kitten or the Roly Poly Pudding where he almost gets cooked into a roly poly with pie crust and, um, and butter by those two dreadful rats. It's a very narrow escape. Whenever I see a roly-poly in an old cookbook, I think of that little book, which is so delightful. There are some recipes in here that I honestly have not seen in any of my other old cookbooks. Well, I suppose I will let you go, but I just thought this was too exciting not to share. If I find any absolute gems that I just need to try, I'll be sure to let you know about it. Who am I kidding? I am going to cook my way through this cookbook. This is beautiful. Clear apple jelly. This is fun because it's preservation season right now. Ooh, lime jelly. Marmalades. Quince marmalade. My quince bush isn't big enough to have fruit yet, but I can't wait until it is. Confectionery, preserved fruits. Oh, preserved rhubarb. Well, this is fun. I always have more rhubarb than I ever put away, and I always feel a little guilty about not putting up rhubarb for the rest of the year. Well, oh, this is the cake section. Ooh, Boston cream cakes biscuit section and the custard section. Wow, this sounds absolutely delicious. Cinnamon cake, that sounds wonderful. Ooh, cherry cake. If you see a recipe in here that I zip past and 
and you'd like me to post a picture of that specific recipe, let me know in the comments and I'll make sure that you get a good look at it so that you can try it if you'd like. Look at all these wonderful recipes for gingerbread. Gingerbread was such a common thing in the 1800s and it's something that we just don't seem to make as often these days. My kids absolutely love gingerbread and considering the staining on this particular page, I have a hunch gingerbread was enjoyed by the family of whoever owned this cookbook as well. Beautiful. It jumbles. That's a kind of cookie I've never made and I always mean to try it. Sponge cakes. Washington cake, muffins. Ah, the bread making section. This is wonderful. Ah, oh, and how to make wine. Ooh, blackberry wine. What do you think? Should we try this when my blackberries are ripe? Let's do it. All right, my friends. Thanks for putting your feet up with me and enjoying this beautiful, beautiful cookbook. Again, this is, here, let's take a look at the spine. How beautiful is that? Practical Cookery and Domestic Economy by Miss Hall. And look at the lovely engravings. You've got abrasive fowl or three fowl that are hanging above some kind of a roast with steam coming up off of it. It says New York. Fish, that's an engraving of some fish. And let's just remember what year this was printed. 1856, what a beauty, an absolute treasure. All right, again, if you happen to see a recipe in here that you'd really like to try, just let me know and I'll be sure to post a picture um, close up of it so that you can read the instructions. Take care, my friends. Hopefully tomorrow we'll be back out in the garden. Thank you.